Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to continue on today with the uh, discussion of continental drift and plate tectonics. And I've got the notes up here on the screen. So this is what we've done so far. We've gone through the uh, evidences that Alfred Wegener came up with for continental drift. And these are the ones that you talked about in your presentation that you did for me. Jigsaw fit of the continents, the fossil evidence, um, the distribution of living species, the geological structures, namely the, uh, you know, like the mountain chains that, uh, that form the boundary where the parts of Pangaea collided. Uh, we talked about the paleoclimates, like the, you know, the, the glacial till deposits in these areas and the coal deposits. And that brings us up to, uh, you know, like Alfred Wegener died in 1930. And at that point, I mean, he, you know, he published various versions of his book on continental drift, but really very few people had taken him seriously. But there were a few younger scientists, like, you know, smart ones, who took his ideas seriously. And um, so, you know, like in around 1925, uh, there was a lot of like pushback against Alfred Wegener because some of the younger scientists were taking it seriously. So the older scientists were like, no, this is a ridiculous idea. It's impossible. It can't work. Continents can't slide around. It's just, it, it's physically impossible. So, you know, no matter how much evidence you have, it's just not possible for it to happen. Well, in 1930, or in the 1930s, I should say, this fellow by the name of Arthur Holmes, he was a geophysicist. I'm going to underline this here now. Uh, so Arthur Holmes, he was a geophysicist who wrote a textbook on geology. And in that textbook, he put forward Alfred Wegener's theories of continental drift. And he proposed that it was convection in the mantle that was the driving force for continental drift. Now, remember, nobody knew that the Earth had layers until the early 1900s. The core was discovered in the 1930s, you know, the fact that we had a core and then a mantle and then a crust. So Arthur Holmes was writing just after the discovery of the stratified layering inside the Earth, and he proposed that mantle convection was the driving force, and this was, so the mantle was convecting. Like if you have a pot of soup on the stove, and, uh, you know, like the, the liquid is rising and falling. And it was that convection in the mantle that was actually driving continental drift, right? So you have your, you know, the Earth's interior, the crust is there. And then you have your inner core, outer core, mantle. And what he said is that you had convection in the mantle. And that convection dragged the surface with it as it moved. So here you have convecting going around a circle. Here you have convecting going around a circle. And the surface of the earth, the crust, would be pulled apart or smashed together depending on which way the mantle was moving. So there's the mantle convection driving force of plate tectonics. And the surface of the earth would be pulled with it. Well, I have this uh, short video queued up which kind of shows you, I mean, like it's, um, you know, it's a lot more modern than, uh, than what Arthur Holmes would have thought, but this is what mantle convection would look like. Now I can't see that the, uh, the play button it's behind that stupid thing. So I'm going to have to hit play there. It happens because hot rock rises. So remember now, the mantle is not a liquid. It is a very hot but plasticky solid that is able to flow and deform and rise and fall because it has these plastic characteristics. It's not brittle and hard like the surface of the earth. So what you're seeing here, I mean, it's, you know, it's just an artist simulation, but... Earth's core. Near the surface, the rock spreads in two directions and goes sideways it begins to lose heat. Eventually, the much cooler rock sinks back down. Through this spreading process, the Earth's crust is very slowly dragged apart. So, yeah, so here's the mantle convection. Uh, down here would be the core. So because the mantle is convecting, churning, it drags the surface of the Earth with it, rips it apart, smashes it together, and that's what Arthur Holmes proposed 
as the driving force behind plate tectonics. So that's what we mean by mantle convection, what you just saw in that video. Now, uh, you know, the Second World War kind of intervened. So like from 1939 until 1945, very little scientific research took place. But one thing that did happen during the Second World War is that the science of sonar was developed because uh, Navy ships needed to be able to um, find submarines, right, like enemy submarines. So after the Second World War, a lot of these ships were then equipped with sonar to map out the ocean floor. And for the first time, scientists began to get a very, very detailed look at the ocean floor. Before that, if you look at, at maps of the world, from back in the 1930s, 1940s, um, the ocean floor was unknown. I mean, we knew more about the surface of the moon than we knew about the ocean floor. It was only in the 1950s that we got a really, really good picture of what the ocean floor looked like. So in the 50s, a tremendous amount of information about the seafloor was discovered, and they discovered that there was a system of ridges about 70,000 kilometers long, and there were trenches twice as deep as the ocean floor. This wasn't discovered until the 1950s. And <clears throat> this fellow by the name of Harry Hess proposed a concept called seafloor spreading. So now, um, Alfred Wagner didn't know anything about this. This was a Harry Hess idea because he knew what the ocean floor looked like. So here's what they saw when they, uh, when they went around the world and did all kinds of, you know, like sonar testing of the seafloor, they noticed that there were very, very deep trenches, and there were very high mid-ocean ridges. And Harry has um, proposed the idea that the ocean floor was being created at the ridges and destroyed at the trenches. Brand new idea. If Alfred Wegener had, knew, had known about this, he would have been very, very pleased. And uh, I have a little video on this as well. So this is a, a, a Bill Nye one from the Discovery Channel. It's all about Harry Hess. Scientists were enlisted to help survey the ocean. Oops, no. World War II. German U-boats were on the prowl. To track them, the Allied forces developed new sonar methods, and scientists were enlisted to help survey the ocean floor. When the United States entered the war, Harry Hess was a geology professor at Princeton University, but he also happened to be a Navy reservist, so it wasn't long before he found himself in command of an attack transport ship in the Pacific. To help maneuver when coming in for a beach landing, Hess's ship was equipped with a depth sounder. Now, still being a geologist at heart, he used the sounder to measure the depth of the ocean floor whenever a ship was out to sea. Now, what he discovered startled him. Until the Second World War, most scientists imagined the bottom of the ocean looked like this, flat, lined with nothing but sediment. But about two miles beneath the waves of the Pacific Ocean, Harry Hess discovered something else entirely. Mountains like these here in California, with deep canyons and trenches, hundreds of high peaks that we now believe were once active volcanoes, and all of this at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Surprisingly, though, the discovery of the Pacific mountain range is not what makes Harry Hess part of our Great 100, and we'll get to that in a minute. To understand where all this is headed, I'd like to skip ahead to another event that set the geology world buzzing. For years, oceanographers surveying the Atlantic Ocean had taken sonar readings that indicated there was something down there, something big. In 1953, they found out what it was, a 12,000-mile-long mountain range. They called it the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Isn't it so great? To fill us in, I paid a visit to Neil Driscoll, a geologist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. One of the big discoveries that was made was that there was this ridge of underwater volcanoes that stood high above the seafloor. How high is a mountain in the middle of the Atlantic? The average seafloor depths are on the order of about four to 5,000 meters. The mid-ocean ridge sits up at about 2,500 meters. So they sit about two and a half kilometers on average higher than the surrounding seafloor that's shown here in the deep blue color. So that's, a, that's over a mile high. Yes. And that's where Harry Hess comes back into the story. Analyzing core samples and sonar readings from around the mid-Atlantic ridge, Hess made an astonishing discovery. 
a phenomenon almost beyond comprehension. The age of the Atlantic Ocean floor, he determined, was progressively older the further it moved away from the ridge. Harry Hess had discovered that the seafloor was spreading. He concluded that molten rock was being forced up from inside the earth at the ridge, where it then formed into new crust on the ocean floor. Gradually, it was pushed away on either side as more molten rock continued pushing up from behind it. Hess called his great discovery seafloor spreading. Harry Hess was in a position that he could bring it all together. Things were spreading apart and new earth was being generated. But if he did this for long enough, the earth should grow. And it doesn't. The earth doesn't get any bigger. No. Harry appreciated the fact that if new earth was being generated in one area, they have to be consumed or recycled in another area. The process that recycles the crust of the spreading ocean floor back inside the earth is called subduction. But as our next great discovery revealed, it's all part of a much larger process, perhaps the most powerful force on the face of the earth. But the earthquakes Hess's discovery that the seafloor was spreading rescued Alfred Wegener's idea of Pangaea from obscurity. Now there was a geological mechanism to explain continental drift. That's simple. It, once you hear it, it sounds great. It does sound great. By the 1960s, both ideas were synthesized into a single theory, the science of plate tectonics. A great discovery that revealed just how complex and dynamic our planet is. Several groups of scientists had concluded that not only is the Earth's crust moving, but the surface of the planet is broken into large, interconnected plates. These plates are constantly in motion, floating on a layer of molten rock in the Earth's mantle. It seems fantastic. I mean, it seems just too crazy. How could the whole world be sliding around? I can see where people were scared. That's right. That's right. But it's the rates that your fingernails grow. It's so not very fast. I don't feel a thing. That's right. Yeah. But cumulatively, it's huge. So the, here's the thing is geologic time scales is what makes this so important. Because if you think of it over a year, you move a few centimeters. Mm -hmm. If you think over millions of years, you're moving kilometers. About 250 million years ago, all the plates were together in Pangaea, and they've been moving apart, and they will come back together again. Why do they move back together? Because the Pacific Ocean right now has subduction all around it, and the plate is actually being consumed and recycled, where the Atlantic Ocean is spreading without much subduction. So the Atlantic Ocean is going to grow, the Pacific Ocean is going to close, and then we'll start getting closer to Asia and closing up the Pacific Ocean. It's crazy. It's it's pretty it's great. Crazy. And once you hear it, it's hard to imagine geologists not believing, not, not believing in it. So once the theory and the mechanism, that was the important contribution. Because no one would believe it until they had it. That's right. So the plates are spreading. They're not plowing. The understanding of plate tectonics has given scientists new insights into the changing face of our planet. A dynamic example of some of those changes can be seen here on the California coastline, where two of the Earth's largest plates, the Pacific and the North American, collide. There's a number of results, but one, we get volcanoes where the plates are subducted back into the Earth. These volcanoes happen because the plate that gets subducted releases water, and this water lowers the melting temperature of the overriding plate and makes it easier, and we get volcanism. So that's where you get Mount Whitney, Mount Shasta. Things like this, absolutely. The Andes are a perfect example of these type of volcanoes. Other places you get the mid-ocean ridges. You get pieces of the seafloor that are one to two kilometers higher than the surrounding seafloor. These are underwater volcanic chains that stretch the length of these ocean basins. Other places you get large strike-slip faults. So what's a strike-slip fault? A strike-slip is when the plates move by one another, mm -hmm. okay? And they don't do it without kinks and twists and so where the kinks and twists are there can be places that lock yeah. and then they release and they release quickly with a lot of energy or momentum tipping over buildings and so on causing a lot of shaking yes but without earthquakes you never would have found all this stuff right earthquakes are really important because they've allowed us to define the plate geometries they've allowed us to define the boundaries so what about volcanoes before volcanoes light off a lot of times there's uh, pre-eruption seismic activity. 
shaking. Yes, yes. As the magma ascends to the surface, it causes stress, and the stress is released. Do you see evidence of plate tectonics right here? Yes. What we're looking at in the sea cliffs, these were deposited, these sediments were deposited about 500 meters below the sea level, and they've been uplifted. So here, we're looking at plate tectonics in our own backyard. Okay, so let's go back and look at this seafloor spreading diagram. This pretty much has, I mean, there's a very large percentage of this course is summarized in this diagram. You've got seafloor spreading taking place at the, uh, at the ridges. You've got seafloor being destroyed at the trenches. And, uh, and this is where the volcanoes are generated over here. Earthquakes are generated because, uh, you know, like there's a lot of friction between these plates. And here's another thing that Harry has discovered because they didn't just do sonar to find out how deep the ocean was. They took samples off the ocean floor. And I need a different color here. They took samples from the seafloor. And you see what's happened here? The rocks get increasingly older as you move away from the ridge. So these rocks over here might only be like a few million years old. And over here, they might be 150 million years old. So the farther you are away from a ridge, the older the rocks get. And there's really only one conclusion. The rocks must be created at the ridges. And then they move away from the ridges slowly over time <clears throat> until they reach the trenches where they're eventually destroyed. So that's seafloor spreading. There's no ocean floor on the, in the world that's older than around 200 million years old, even though the continents themselves can be billions of years old. And uh, the reason for that is the continents are made of very buoyant material. It can't be driven back down into the mantle. Once formed, continental crust sticks around. It's permanent. But the ocean floor, because it's dense and thin, will eventually be driven back down into the mantle and destroyed. So we don't have any old ocean floor. Like, there's no old oceans anywhere. There's only old continents. The, o the ocean floors are in a continual state of recycle. You know, there's another piece of evidence here of continental drift and paleomagnetism. And I showed you a video um, called Magnetic Storm, which talks about the Earth's magnetic field reverses every few hundred thousand years. I don't know if you can remember that now. It was before our Easter break um, when we were talking about the Earth's interior and, you know, like the fact that the magnetic field is generated in the outer core through the movement of that hot liquid iron and the electric currents that are generated in that hot liquid iron. And that's what, that's what creates our magnetic field. But we know that it reverses every couple hundred thousand years or so. Now, here's something that was discovered um, back in the 1960s. The ocean floor is magnetized, uh, normal, reversed, normal, reversed. And as you kind of go over the oceans, you find that the ocean is divided up into strips that are magnetized normally and magnetized reversed. Now, people couldn't understand that at first, but these two fellows by the name of Vine and Matthews, they solve that problem by saying that as the seafloor spreads, which is the idea that Harry Hess came up with, um, you know, new ocean floors coming up here, it's made of molten material. And as that molten material crystallizes or solidifies in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, it gets magnetized normally pointing towards the north or magnetized pointing towards the south if it comes up during a period when the Earth's magnetic field is reversed. So all of the ocean floors are made up of parallel strips. They're symmetrical on either side of the ridges where the ocean floor is normal, reversed, normal, reversed, right? And it just keeps going on like that. And I have another little video here that, uh, that explains that. So here's the magnetic reversals. I'll start at the beginning here. The Earth's magnetic field and how um, the reversals in the Earth's magnetic field revealed that seafloor spreading is happening. The Earth's magnetic field uh, creates lines of invisible force that uh, you can't see, but that your compass needle senses. And um, the reason your needle points north is that these field lines emerge from the south magnetic pole and wrap around and point toward the north magnetic pole. Now, uh, we know that the Earth's magnetic field has actually reversed, flipped around, so that these arrows would all point 
the other direction coming out of the north and pointing into the south pole and these are called magnetic reversals they happen every few million years the earth's magnetic field flips back and forth through time uh, the reason we know this is that lava flows like this lava flow on hawaii uh, when lava flows out of the earth it actually uh, there's little magnetic minerals in the lava and they line up with the magnetic field at the time uh, and actually preserve like a tape recorder the direction of the earth's magnetic field whichever way it was pointing either normal or reversed so if we go look at a whole series of lava flows um, what we'll find if we sample through the lava layers into older and older layers we'll find some layers that are oriented with a magnetic field say like today and other layers mag older layers that are reversed and then still older layers that are like today so through geologic time the earth's magnetic field flips back and forth and we call these uh, magnetic polarity reversals now the way that this all relates to seafloor spreading uh, can be realized by remembering that lava is pouring out of the earth at mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so I want you to imagine that we're going to let this ocean basin spread and we're going to let the earth's magnetic field flip back and forth as the ocean basin spreads. Remember that when the lava erupts and cools down, it records the direction of the magnetic field at the time, whether it's normal or reversed, backwards or forwards. So we'll start the animation here. We're going to start it at a time when the Earth's magnetic field is like today, what we call normal polarity. And as the seafloor spreads, it's all going to get pol polarized in the direction of the magnetic field shown by the blue uh, part of the ocean floor. But now we have a reversal happening, and any new lava that erupts is going to get magnetized in the opposite direction. So you can see the little compass needles here have flipped, showing us that all this new seafloor has is recording the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at a time when it was reversed. Now we'll let the Earth's polarity flip again. Any new lava that forms is going to record the polarity of the Earth at that time. So what we see on the mid-ocean ridges of the world today is a series of stripes, symmetrical stripes on both sides of the ridges of seafloor rock that's magnetized in the same direction as the magnetic field today, older rock that's reversed, still older rock that's back to normal. This, is a, this pattern is impossible to explain if seafloor spreading didn't actually happen and the Earth's magnetic field didn't flip back and forth. So it constitutes some of the best evidence we have that sea, the seafloor is actually spreading over geologic time. Nice. So that video, you know, explained this kind of pattern right here. Um, yeah, there you go. So like as the seafloor spreads, those strips get magnetized normally and reversed. And the, um, you know, like all of the lava flows, they're, they're recording the direction that the Earth's magnetic field is pointing, whether it's toward the North Pole or towards the South Pole during a period of reversal. And all of that led to the theory of plate tectonics being accepted by pretty much the entire scientific community in around 1968. And so here's the Here's what the, the map of the Earth looks like divided up into plates, right? There's the world's tectonic plates. I have another couple little videos here to show you. This one is, uh, this one shows you the seafloor spreading taking place. So these are little pieces of the mid-ocean ridge. And here's the molten material coming up into the cracks, forming brand new ocean floor. And the, uh, the, the gray, you can see over here on this diagram, so here's the field, normal, reversed, normal, reversed, and the ocean floor gets magnetized, uh, normal and reversed, um, you know, while it's coming up. So I've got this animation here, which shows the breakup of Pangaea going back 250 million years ago. And all of this information comes from, um, you know, like the paleomagnetism of lava flows. So the Atlantic Ocean, I think, is born around 180 million years ago. First, North America separates. Then later, much later, actually, South America and Africa separate. You can see that <clears throat> South America is an is an island for quite a long period of time in the same way that Australia is today. And it's only in the last couple million years that it has reconnected to North America. 
Well, um, I think, you know, maybe tomorrow we'll talk about the different kinds of boundaries, like the, the convergent and divergent boundaries <clears throat> that occur. But for right now, I think you are at a point where you should be able to do a fair amount of the questions. Let me see now if I have the, uh, the most recent one, the plate tectonics that were handed out in class. Oops, not in there. Earth systems. Notes in Word. Date modified. So here's the print copy that I handed out. So this is what yours looks like. It's uh, got two columns on it. And if you go down here, so we looked at this, the seafloor spreading stuff, the Earth's magnetic field, the paleomagnetism, Vine and Matthews, the plate tectonic stuff. And then down at the end of this document, I think I had the uh, uh, crossword puzzle in there. And let's see how much of this, I don't know, some of this you can do, some of it you can't do. Uh, this I think you can do. There's a lot of this that's possible for you to, for you to do. That sheet at the end. Um, the Earth Systems textbooks over at the side, right, like the, the old junky textbooks over on the side there, they have the answers there and they, uh, the page numbers to the questions are in there. So if you want to grab those textbooks, you can work on this, uh, this review sheet at the end of that handout. And you can do, I think, up as far as number 29, I think. So we've covered the material up to number 29. Uh, so that's what I'll get you to do now is work on that document, the chapter 19 review. Oops, something's going on there. Some kind of videos on the go. All right, so work on that document up to there. And let's see, let's go in here. <clears throat> So edit and work on questions at the end of the handout up to number 29 and uh, use the books on the side. Here we go, folks. That's it. Thanks for listening.